I think there are days when you preach a sermon that you are very nervous to preach because you become aware of an area within the family that needs to be addressed, looked at, scrutinized, and even behavior needs to change. But there are times when you feel that there is so much in your heart to encourage the church with that you are sitting and saying, how do I tell you how grateful God must be for you? Vutu, there's a few things you didn't say this morning, and he sent a report, and you're welcome to get a copy of it. He works extensively in the Paul area. There's a Zimbabwean gentleman that was baptized. We are holding a marriage workshop at the congregation in about November, I think it's the third, the weekend of the third or the sixth, and spending uh, time to work within the community of Kailicha to help the church, strengthen the church through any means necessary. When one looks at the environment we are in, I think we, we sometimes become discouraged. But there was a simple comment made many years ago by Rob Stodel, funny enough, who was my boss many years ago, And he said to me, because I had a very difficult um, situation with a few guys that were doing the oddest things, and he says to me, I'm not going to say the expletives that he said, but I'm going to try to sum it up very nicely. He said to me, Derek, do something. Jump up and down. I'll give you permission. Take a thousand, two thousand rand item. Crash it to the floor. Scream, shout, rant and rave so that these people will see that you're angry. Now, the reason I'm saying that is that sometimes we want to do something demonstrably, but the principle of it is is just that he says, do something. And that's what is happening in Kailicha, doing something. And everyone that was part of that, and is part of it, is doing something that's going to bring the kind of effect that we desire. Have you ever in your life asked the question, Lord, I want you to change, to help me, to use me, to change the world around me? Have you ever asked the question when you look at people like Mandela and many other people and you say, I would love to make the kind of changes in society in a positive way? Have you ever asked the question, how can I be an instrument in the hand of a righteous God? That people will look past what I've done, but will see the hand of God in all of this. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is probably my favorite passage when it speaks about this morning's lesson. 2 Corinthians 9 from 10 says the following, And if you wonder why do we give to God, why do we put the plate around, why do we ask for benevolence, why do we do what we do, why do we preach the gospel of Christ to people around us, it's because of this. He who supplies seeds for the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you may be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result, watch this, in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, men will praise God, watch, for your obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ, and for your generosity in sharing with Him and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. This week past, we've made an appeal on Sunday and said we would like to give Sharon about a 10,000 rand that will help her. Did you know she needed to take unpaid leave? And it, it translates to a lot of money. Cars broken, house hasn't got food, one of us, her son has lost his position, the company closed down, and so on and so on. But this week, I was astounded. Money just poured in, folk pledged, 
folk very quietly made sure that there was food and people brought meat to the building. And we could deliver it to the family on Friday and speak to the family and tell them that this is a gracious God that has compelled the hearts of His people. That they will see that your hearts are the ones that are reaching out to them. <coughs> I spoke to Adrian's sister, Lorraine. I want to share with you. She said to me, Derek, I'm not a church goer by any stretch of the imagination. I arrived here to come and say goodbye to my brother. <coughs> but I want you to tell this congregation. She says, tell them this. That if ever I would become a child of God, and if ever I would follow Christ, and if ever I want to be a part of any family or people, it would be this congregation. You have shown more love for my brother, even though he has not obeyed the gospel of Christ, because we, I spoke to Adrian about that openly. And she says, if that was your mark, then he should only have been the recipient after he obeyed Christ. <coughs> but you guys have loved my family, and you have carried my sister-in-law. And she says, if ever I will turn, it's because of that. <coughs> it's ironic <coughs> that Jesus would make a comment and say in John chapter 13, verse 34, 34 and 35, he says to you and I, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you should love one another as I have loved you. And then he says, by this the world will know that you are truly my disciples, if you have love one for one another. You see, people, when they are lying in a bed and they are dying and they are sick, and when you walk into a family's room where the son of 16 years old, right next to you in Bontes, has just died, the last thing they want to hear from you is that there is a problem between them and God because of a doctrinal truth that we differ on, which is crucial. But it's not the time and the place for it. And when you gather the hand of an old pastor and you say to him, Sir, I want to ask you if you will allow me to say a prayer on your behalf of your family. And he pulls you closer and he holds your hand, your face in your hand, and you're thinking the guy's going to kiss you. But he says, God has sent you. He says, there lies my grandson and I cannot even pray because I'm coming apart. Then you know that you are the son and you're an instrument of a righteous God. When you hold the hands of a family and a mom is trying to shake her son awake when he's lying there dead and she's screaming at the top of her voice, why did you leave me? And you pray and you ask God to give a peace that does not even begin to be comprehended by all of us. You start to understand the role of you and I in the hands of a righteous God. This morning, I want to speak to us as a family. Thank you very much, buddy. <clears throat> Thanks, my boy. That you will see that what we are doing is far greater than just preaching, teaching, teaching on a Sunday morning, taking the Lord's Supper. It is reconstructing a society that is in badly in need of a Redeemer. I have studied world religions, all of them. Not one of them has got a comprehensive structure to it that reconstructs, mends, and heals the human psyche as Christianity does. If you ask me why I believe in Jesus Christ, I believe in Jesus Christ because every aspect of what he has is crucial to that intent of God. When Jesus Christ died for things, for, for, for you and I, he died so that the image of Christ can be reconstructed within your and my life. I was spending a lot of time in research, and I was spending time with a few vendor brethren while I was at lectureship. Can I share some things that will shock you? There's things that intrigue me about the church over there. It is growing by leaps and bounds every single year. About five or six churches are, are built, and churches are being built in the vendor nation. It is growing at an exponential rate, far greater than any other nation in the entire Africa. One American missionary made a comment to me. He says to me, Derek, can I tell you and shock you, the day will come when you guys will have to send missionaries to come and work with us. I sat with a few Bender brethren, and I said, I want you to tell me what is the secret ingredient, and let me shock you. It's family. South Africa has made the most profound comment 
one of the ladies, and I think it was the first thing that made sense to me this year, where they said the core fan f a nuclear family is fundamental to reconstruction of our society. Let me say this to you, and I'm going to add to it, that no other organism than the church of our Lord Jesus Christ has got the right dynamics and, and, and correct construction to be able to reconstruct our society. I sat with the vendor brethren and I spoke to them and I wanted to know exactly where this thing comes from and how it is reconstructed. How come only in the vendor society it is growing so well? Again, structure and family. They find it strange when you talk about going to a psychiatric ward or seeing a therapist. Why? Because they've got elders. They find it strange when you talk about diseases like cancer and they talk about things like hypertension. They talk about things like, like diabetes, stress. It is foreign to them. Why? Because of the structure of their society which takes care of family. I have wonderful friends and every now and then when I phone them, they're off to Venda. But that was not a lesson on Venda today. What I want to speak to us this morning, so often we speak about what we don't do right. But today I want to talk about what we do right. To continue excelling in that. To continue doing what is so amazing and so phenomenal. And that is to continue cultivating brotherly love for one another. It's the love that God has given to us through Jesus Christ that binds us. It is congregational. It's familial. In fact, there was one psalm that says God places the injured and the hurting in families. Webster would say to you and I, kindness is a demonstration. It's a work. It is not a feeling. It's an expression of love. It's a demonstration. It is love in action. And maybe today you ask the question, does kindness always pay off? And I want to tell you a very quick story. Sometimes we do not know what brings people to specific places in their lives. There was a wonderful story I heard, and I think it'll be up in his alley. A woman was standing at a bus stop, and she had just cashed a tax refund check, and she was carrying a, a huge amount of money in her purse, and she was very anxious about it, Bernie. So she looked around very anxiously and watched. There was a shabbily de uh, dressed man standing nearby, and as she watched, she saw a long, young, another man walk to him, hand him the money, and whisper something in his ear. And so eventually she was so touched by this act of kindness, she goes across to this gentleman in a burst of generosity. She takes out a $10 bill out of her wallet, and she goes to him and whispers to him, never despair, never despair. And anyway, she walks away, and the gentleman says, thank you very, very much. And the next day, she comes to the same bus stop, and there she was again. She walks to this gentleman, and he hands her $110, Bernie. And so she was dumbfounded. She says, what is this? And he says to her, she says, you won, lady. Never despair paid out 10 to 1 yesterday on the racetrack. <laughs> one kind of worries what got him there. But the picture is that biblical truths will teach you and I that kindness will cost you. It's work. It's a discipline. But what he does tell you, it'll pay back 10 to 1, Bernie. It always pays back. Listen to Jesus Christ, what he says. Not a cup of cold water. Ah, oh, and I love this. Cup of cold water will be given to you that will not be rewarded. He also says, give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over. It'll pour into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I pray that you'll believe what Jesus is saying. Frank Bonte is one of the wonderful friends that we've had in this congregation. He was in charge of our benevolence. And if you ever found somebody that was vociferous for what he believed in, it was him. He said to me one day, he says, you know, Derek, you know what drives me? I said, what, Uncle Frank? He says, there's a passage in the book of Psalms that says, when you give to God, when you give to the poor, you lend to God. Can you imagine that God's borrowing money from you or borrowing something from you, Don? It just blows my brain. But the kind of thing that I know our God, brethren, he says, I will pay for you and I will give back in dividends, far beyond what you could even have imagined. Human kindness, brethren, takes diligence to be kind to human beings and to be gentle with people. 
holding people's hands, when they are crying and when they are vulnerable. Firstly, brethren, the question on the table is why? Why should we be kind? In the first case, we must be kind because it is an attribute of God. First Peter chapter 1, a paraphrase says, The purpose of revealed religion is to bring us to the character of God. God wants us to conform to His image, to become like Him. God is love and He demonstrates His loving kindness towards us. Listen to what Nehemiah says while he was rebuilding the wall. He says, Thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger. Listen to what he says about what he knows about God. He says, you abundant in loving kindness. Listen to what David says. He says, God is gentle, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and is good to all. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. He says, God makes the sun go up and the rain fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. And listen to what he says. He says, I want you to be like your father. The idea for you and I is that the kindness of God lies at the heart of who He is. We see God's kindness, brethren, in nature. We see it in the daily blessings that we have. We see it when a mother is nursing her child. That's kindness of God. The question is, are we becoming more like Him? And are we excelling in being kind to each other? In the second place, kindness produces joy in the one who gives it. Studies were done in psychology recently, brethren, and it's very interesting to find that, now this is something Christianity knew and Solomon knew many years ago, and Johann wrote an article which he sent out to everybody, but in that article he makes a comment that scientifically or, or quantitatively has been proven that the greatest joy you get is not by buying things for yourself, by giving away to others. Isn't that interesting? Solomon said so 4,000 years ago. The world's only discovering it now. We receive blessings from God. Don't miss the point of this. Genuine family happiness, brethren, is not your bank account. It's not in the abundance of things that you own or the quality of what you own. Not even the popularity of who you are or the political clout that you carry. But it's how you treat others. God created us for relationships. And it's in the relationships that we find happiness. Way back, and we look in the Judaic history, especially within the book of Genesis, when God created Adam and Eve, and He tells Adam, He says to him, He creates Eve, sorry, out of, He forms her, sorry, out of a, a bone on the side, on His side. He sees her, He says, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. He recognizes her, but there is something that God recognized. He turned around, she says, she's good, very good. And when we look at that, we might say, well, I get it. It's like something like a Ferrari compared to a Volkswagen Beetle, 1975. No, it's not. It's got nothing to do with an object or the quality in comparison. It's got to do with the encounter between a God and what he had created. The same way when you and I lift the spirits of people in their dire needs and are there for them in that moment of great vulnerability when only God is the audience. That is the moment when God looks at you and he says that connection between those two humans is good, very good. It's the kind of thing that we need to wake up to. It's, we've got access to it in His Word. Thirdly, we should be kind because it's beneficial to other people. When we are kind to people, we give to them what they don't have. We, like Jesus, fed the multitudes, healed the sick. His treatment of the sinner, His time spent with children, family, and close friends. We watch Jesus' way that he was kind to people. We see him at Jacob's well. We see him talking to Zacchaeus. We see him dealing with the woman at the well. We see him dealing with the ten lepers, the blind, the sick, and the outcast. We watch him with the thief on the cross. We see him dealing with the soldiers who crucified him. And we also see the way that he deals with his mother and with John, who will take care of her. And most of all, we see how he deals with us when he forgives us on the cross how do we do it? How do we actually do that and transition and continue transitioning to a people that understands that they are a conduit of God? 
God gives you in abundance whatever you have. And there is an obligation because of that to make sure that it goes out to others. Second Corinthians chapter 9 promises you. He says, if you give, I will increase your store. If you give, I will make sure you have more to give. It's ironic to find that people that are very generous always gets more. And the reason is because God does not pour water into a dead well. But he wants it to be a stream. In the first place, we must behave and act out of proper motive. The world will say to you and I, me first. It's what I want. It's how I feel. It's more important that others want and what, 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 what I feel at this time. No, no, no. In fact, the world will train people to, to intimidate Manipulate, be aggressively assertive. You train to never let others know what you are thinking and to be stoic and how you can be professional. It's a heap of God's wallop. Because I listen to that and it's rubbish. It's completely counterintuitive to the human heart. The human heart will say to you, I'm vulnerable. I'm here to help. I'm here to see that you are going to get and be all that you can be within the parameters and the will of God. That is what, what God is about. God wants us to be humble. God wants us to be vulnerable. God wants us to see the vulnerable and, and help them, not to take advantage of them. God wants us to be open, to show people our motive, and literally be comfortable to say to a woman, I want you to know that this entire church are people that have got pure motive when they are dealing with you or with any one of your relatives. We've got nothing to hide. We do not work in smoke and mirrors. We are truth-seeking and truth-obeying people. When you deal with people, you deal with people with their hurts. When they are struggling, you don't judge them. You don't scheme how to perpetrate and revenge and retaliation and say, well, you see, you do it like this or you do it like that. No, you say you trust in God regardless. We must be like Jesus. Biblical kindness is being understanding that people are vulnerable and that God is their strength. In the second place, we must be willing to take time to be kind. The other day I was convicted in my soul. I needed to be with Sharon to pick her up to take her to hospital. And I realized the car did not have any petrol. And I, and I rushed to the petrol station and I turned around and I want to tell you what I said to this man. And he said to me, good morning, sir. Can I help you? Can I put some petrol in your car? I said, please put X amount of petrol in my car and will you hurry up? I watched his face just became very ashen. And I, and I called him, I said, excuse me, if I sounded very ugly toward you, it's not because I am that way. But there's a person that is, needs to get to a husband and he's very sick. And he turned out and he said, thanks for telling me that. Now let me tell you why I'm telling you this. Because if you, you'll know how many of our brethren are pumping petrol. How many men that has been converted to Christ, that is the only way of income. It struck me to my soul that I will do the very thing that I hate most people do to me. We must remember to be like Jesus. And it takes time to feed the hungry. And I praise God for you. That makes time. That gives and says, give me a shoebox. Give me two. Give me four. I will have less of a, of a, of a joyous time at the end of the year. And I'll make sure that I bring excitement and joy to the hearts of a child this year. Giving the thirsty something to drink. Inviting the stranger in. Clothing the poor. Visiting the sick and the imprisoned. Serving and giving them Jesus. That is who we are. In the third place, kindness is making an effort to understand others. Joe South in the 70s wrote a song. And my wife said, please, Derek, don't sing it to people this morning. So I promise you I'm not going to sing it. Hey, love. Hey, love. He says the following, the song goes, walk a mile in my shoes. And it goes like this. If I could, no. <laughs> if I could be you, if you could be me just for an hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's mind. If you could see that through my eyes instead of your ego, 
I believe you'd be surprised to see that you've been blind. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Hey, before you abuse, criticize, and accuse, walk a mile in my shoes. Now your world you see around you is just a reflection, and the law of common says you're going to reap just what you sow. So unless you've lived a life of total perfection, you'd better be careful of every stone that you should throw. And yet you spend the day throwing stones at one another, because I don't think or wear my hair the same way that you do. Well, I have, I may be common people, but I'm your brother. And when you strike out, you're trying to hurt me. It's hurting you. Lord, have mercy. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes, babe. Sorry, that was actually quite a, that, that is genuinely the lyric. Before you abuse, criticize, and accuse, walk a mile in my shoes. And there are people on reservations and out in the ghettos. And brother, there, by the grace of God, go you and I. And if I only had wings of a little angel, well, don't you know, I'd fly to the top of a hill, and then I'd cry. Walk a mile in my shoes, walk a mile in my shoes. Babe, before you accuse, criticize, and abuse, better walk a mile in my shoes. Try before what you're doing. Walk a mile in my shoes, walk a mile in my shoes. Oh, before you abuse, criticize, and accuse, walk a mile in my shoes. Brendan, I can tell you the most profound thing is to sit with someone and ask them to tell your story. Tell me your story. Tell me where you are at the moment, and you will find that something magically happens inside of you. Your perception of that person deepens. Your understanding of who and where they are becomes one that is internally planted by a holy God that helps you to see the way that Jesus sees people. It's ironic to see that when you talk about going for training and clinical therapy and all those wonderful things, They teach you something very simple, and that's called active listening. Isn't it interesting that we watch how Jesus practiced that? He would sit at the woman at the well, and he'd ask her questions. Tell me about yourself. And after she told him, he'd say to her, now let me tell you something that you maybe not told me entirely. It convicted her soul. And so often you might ask the question, what's the value of listening to somebody? You need to listen to their pain to their heartaches, their misfortunes, maybe even their cries amidst their tears. Listen to them and become sensitive to people. Feel their pain and their anxiety and see where they are. You see, brethren, I think our society talks much less today. We find it easier to write an email and sometimes an email that will put people just in their places. But we must use every vehicle possible to talk more to people to talk more. Let's talk this thing through. Don't just think the way that you do. Keep the lines of communication open. Families grow apart. Husbands and wives fail to solve problems. Families rupture. Church splits because people stop talking. We as, as a congregation need to get each other to talk more. Elders are wonderful in this congregation. They get people to talk. Spouses talk to your mate. Parents and children talk to each other. Church members, don't just leave it there. Talk to each other. Friends, keep talking. Spend good time with each other. The picture of being kind to each other, brethren, is very critical. And then finally, we must be mindful of little things. Kindness is demonstrated in little things. Solomon said, the little foxes spoil the wine. Carelessness and genuine will destroy genuine kindness. But kindness will build up again. For us as husbands, I think we need to help around the house, pick up our clothes from the floor, dry the dishes, open the doors maybe for our wife so that she can get in. Maybe at num- in the morning, first thing, you bring her a cup of coffee and tell her, I'm so blessed to be married to you. And many of our men are doing that already, so I'm pre- preaching to the choir Maybe we need to take the wife out to a movie and just spend time with her. I want to read a little poem to you very quickly about a husband. He said, I have wept in the night from the shortness of sight that to the needs of others made me blind. But I never have yet had cause to regret 
for being a little too kind. Do the best that you can. Care for people. Do what you are doing. Write SMSs to, to each other. Encourage each other. Don't sit down and say, so-and-so hasn't been to church in five weeks' time. If you know about it, and I love Peter's comment today, it's incumbent upon all of us to encourage each other daily. Call each other. Where are you? How are you? In lastness, I must just say to you, what we learned this morning is that kindness has been shown by you, by your love in action. Kindness has been shown by you, that when people were crying, you never raised your voice. Kindness has been shown by you, that when you saw that people were hurting, you showed concern. Kindness has been shown by you, when you were sweet and you were courteous to people. Kindness has been shown by you, when you did the unexpected and gave the unsolicited. Kindness has been shown by you. That when people have done a wrong, you have kept that secret buried deep in your heart between you and God. Kindness has been shown by you when you have protected the reputations of people so that they can be more effective in the kingdom of God. Kindness has been shown by you when you have never spoken all that is on your mind. Kindness has been shown by you when you have never promoted embarrassment, but always promoted goodwill and uplift for people. Kindness has been shown by you when you sent a note of appreciation and of encouragement. Kindness has been shown by you when your whole attitude and character has been dressed in humility. Kindness has been shown by you when you step back and have honored others long before you've tried to get honor for yourself. Kindness will always enrich the one on whom you bestow it. But kindness will always be a rich fruit that God will show you when you come home one day. I refer you to a little story I read many years ago as a little child. I was known for never going into any place, into on a, on a bus, on a radio, on anywhere, in, a, week, in a, a break, except if I'm playing soccer, I'd be reading something. And many years ago, I picked up a little book <clears throat> given out by the Blind Society. And the one page was torn. But in that page, it was this poem was written, I'm not going, I don't know the whole poem, but it's just this little phrase, that she says, love and kindness is like a rose, like rose, rose oil. It says you can throw it abroad on everyone you see, and you can't help that they'll fall on you sometime. You see, when we are kind to people, Don, we uplift people. We raise their hearts. We watch, like I said on Sunday, on Wednesday, seeing this pastor standing and he says, I don't know what to say. I saw his son on Sunday past and his son was in sedation, but they were treating him. And there was Adrian who we came to pretty much close the chapter on. Wednesday, that young man passed away, 16 years old, grade 11, strapping young rugby player, and Adrian Bontes is recovering. It blows your mind, doesn't it? How does this happen? Well, I think in a lot of ways we prayed as the parents prayed for their children, but we don't understand what God has in mind. And until then, we must keep our opinions to ourselves and just say, thank you, Lord. And please keep on drawing it close to you. Because the Lord has Adrian's soul at the top of his priority list. We need to keep that at the top of ours.